Week three, unit five, exercise one. It has been suggested that people gradually internalize norms to which they initially adhere for reputational reasons. A person tells the truth because he fears a reputation for dishonesty, but over time he internalizes the norm of truth telling, and tells the truth because if he lied he would feel guilty. I do not know whether this is true. But it certainly sounds reasonable. A better example might be that of a person who migrates from a culture in which people greet by bowing to a culture in which people greet by shaking hands. This person initially shakes hands because he realizes that if he failed to do so, he would offend people. Over time, he gets into the habit of shaking hands. He does not have to think about whether it is appropriate in a particular context. He just does it, instinctively relying on a newly gained cultural competence. Exercise two. The key issue with any disposal option is safety, which is mainly achieved by concentration and containment involving the isolation of suitably conditioned radioactive waste in a disposal facility. Containment uses many barriers around the radioactive waste to restrict the release of radionuclides into the environment. Such an approach is key to waste storage and disposal. It is termed the multi-barrier concept and is often called matryoshka after the popular Russian doll, which has inside of each larger doll a smaller one, so that the total number of dolls barriers is large. The confining barriers can be either natural or engineered, that is, obtained via processing. Radioactive materials are used extensively in medicine, agriculture, research, manufacturing, non-destructive testing, and minerals exploration. The accepted approach is to use more reliable barriers for more hazardous waste, including engineered barriers, which results from the radioactive waste treatment and conditioning processes. Exercise three: The law of the 19th century and today encouraged producers to pump quickly. Oil discoveries were governed by the rule of capture, developed in medieval England to resolve hunting disputes. It stated that if a deer or a bird moved from one estate to another, the latter estate's owner could kill the animal with no recompense to the former. For no one can say how and why deer or birds move; they are part of the commons shared by all. Similarly, landowners had the right to draw whatever wealth lay beneath it, even if drilling sucked their neighbor's property dry. As one English judge wrote, the rule of capture applied because no one really understood what happened in the hidden veins of the earth. In effect, the rule of capture meant. Take as much as you can, as fast as you can, before your neighbor does the same to you. Conservationists and economists know this problem as the tragedy of the commons. It is a tragedy founded in ignorance. Exercise four. It was only fifty years ago that humanity began to extend its presence into space, first with robots, then with animals, and finally with humans. This tentative expansion of our species towards other worlds has been made possible by the development of technology, which has finally started to reach a level that can complement and support our imagination and desire for exploration. However, considering the size of the universe and the growing number of promising sites on many worlds where life might quite like to snuggle up, the search has barely begun. When we finally find life on another world, and we will, it will be one of the most significant cultural events in human history, having a profound impact on the question of our origins. It is not surprising, therefore, to find that such possibilities have been discussed by every human civilization and culture, primitive or advanced, as far back as we have written records. Even before these thoughts were given a name, such extraterrestrial wonderings found their outlet through myths, cave paintings, fictional literature, music, and poetry. Then later through films and TV shows. Exercise five through six. Negative experiences might have value for a person. For instance, working the graveyard shift in a bottling plant one summer while in college toughened me up. 
but negative experiences have inherent negative side effects, such as psychological discomfort or the health consequences of stress. They can also create or worsen conflicts with others. When my wife and I were tired and exhausted raising two young children, we snapped at each other more often. The costs of negative experiences routinely outweigh their benefits, and often there's no benefit at all, just pain with no gain. Since neurons that fire together wire together, staying with a negative experience past the point that's useful is like running laps in hell. You dig the track a little deeper in your brain each time you go around it. On the other hand, positive experiences always have gain and rarely have pain. They usually feel good in the moment. Additionally, the most direct way to grow inner strengths, such as determination, a sense of perspective, positive emotions, and compassion, is to have experiences of them in the first place. If you want to develop more gratitude, keep resting your mind on feeling thankful. If you want to feel more loved, look for and stay with experiences in which you feel included, seen, appreciated, liked, or cherished. The answer to the question of how to grow good things inside your mind is this take in experiences of them. This will weave them into your brain, building up their neural circuits so you can take them with you wherever you go. Exercise 7. In oral cultures, knowledge is limited to the collective memory of the group. This puts a serious limitation on the amount that can be known, and it makes such knowledge very fragile. If the wisdom of the tribe is not committed to memory, then it cannot be passed on to the next generation and will be permanently lost. Given this, oral societies tend to encode their knowledge in formulaic patterns, such as rhymes. Proverbs and cliches, which are easy to memorize. They also tend to be cognitively conservative. For any experimentation or divergence from established ways of thinking puts the wisdom that has been accumulated over generations at risk. On the plus side, members of oral cultures are sometimes capable of prodigious feats of memory. Some scholars speculate that Homer's Iliad was originally an oral text. Which, despite being passed on by word of mouth from one storyteller to the next, was preserved with remarkable fidelity. Indeed, the story itself may have been composed centuries before it was first written down. Exercise 8. Attempts to end government support for destructive fossil fuels are already underway. The End Oil Aid Bill, introduced in the U.S. in April 2007, seeks to end government support for the international operations of oil companies, calling on international financial institutions to stop financing oil and gas projects. Calculations by the World Bank and the OECD show that removing such support globally could reduce carbon dioxide emissions by around 10% worldwide. There has been a controversy about whether environmental regulation by international organizations is at least partially responsible for the observed decline in recent economic growth. Similar proposals were put forward in 2001 at a meeting of the G8 in Genoa, where a report commissioned by member countries called on nations to remove incentives and other supports for environmentally harmful energy technologies. It also encouraged them to shift the priorities of international lending agencies like the World Bank to support more clean energy projects in poor countries. Exercise 9. Edison knew, as did others, that running electricity through a variety of materials could make those materials glow, a process called incandescence, thereby producing a light source that could be used as an alternative to candles and natural gas lamps. The problem was that the glowing material, the filament, would degrade after a short while, making its use as a household lighting device impractical. Not knowing any of the physical principles by which electricity destroyed the filament, Edison simply tried every material he could to see if one would glow brightly yet resist burning out.
After trying 1,600 different materials, including cotton and turtle shell, he happened upon carbonized bamboo, which turned out to be the filament of choice, to the joy of turtles everywhere. When used in an air-evacuated bulb, i.e. a vacuum tube, the carbonized bamboo outshone and lasted much longer than any of the other tested filaments. Edison had his light bulb. Although tungsten soon replaced carbonized bamboo in home light bulbs, illumination by incandescence became the predominant mode of interior lighting for many decades to follow. Exercise 10. Horses and mules learn through many small steps, and your ability to follow through successfully with the small steps will help you refine your animal to whatever level you desire. Introducing a new watering device or some other barn feature will give you an opportunity to help the animal to learn. Let's say that the waterer is an automatic one with a ball to push to access the water reservoir. The horse will not know to push on the ball unless taught. You can teach him to push the ball by first familiarizing him with the waterer, then bounce the ball up and down. The animal may startle at first but will soon recognize the ball as harmless. Push the ball down so the water comes to the surface and splash your hand in it. Remember, you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make him drink. You will probably have to repeat this process more than once. Exercise 11 through 12. Technology has opened up the possibility of working, communicating, producing, and being entertained whilst only using one or two small devices. All of the tools we use to need, paper, notebooks, pens, pencils, erasers, paper clips, staplers, and on and on, can all be tipped in the trash. With them can go surplus electronic equipment, such as calculators, DVD players, radios, TVs, home telephones, cameras, and printers, followed by the redundant books, DVDs, CDs, and photographed albums. Minimalism is an idea of the Internet age, and it is noticeable that while minimalists advocate a life without many of the things most of us take for granted, they cling to their laptops and tablets. Little wonder, for these are the devices that make minimalism possible. The laptop is the perfect minimalist tool for work, leisure, and a whole lifestyle. If the family gathered on the living room sofa watching TV symbolized 20th century consumerism, the minimalist with a laptop symbolizes a new era. Minimalism is sometimes presented as a getting back to essentials or returning to a simpler way of life, but rather than giving up things, it is perhaps better to think of minimalism as the digitalization of our possessions. Instead of filling their homes, Minimalists fill hard drives. It is a way of streamlining our lives to make the most of the technology available.